Uh, good evening, everybody. I'll be presenting a case on uh, meconium aspiration syndrome. Next slide. Yeah. So uh, this baby, baby of uh, ABC, 38 weeks, two days gestational age, single baby with birth weight of 3.5 kg, born by LSCS to 34 years old, gravida 3, para 2, live 1, female, with meconium stained amniotic fluid at a private nursing home. Baby developed respiratory distress immediately after birth, which was progressively worsening. Because that private nursing home didn't have any NICU, so the baby was shifted to government hospital at one hour age. Currently, the baby is postnatal age of 3 days and 12 hours and is on non-invasive ventilation mode of ventilation and on tube feeding of 25 ml to hourly. Next slide. So, I'll share antenatal history. Uh, the baby was born to a 34 years old, gravida 3, para 2, live 1. Uh, it was a non-consanguous marriage. Baby was a product of spontaneous conception. Very conceptional folic acid was given. First trimester was uneventful. There was no rash, no history of fever or bleeding. During second trimester, baby was uh, the mother was given iron and calcium. Two doses of DT were given. There was history of gestational hypertension, which was detected in the late third trimester. And patient was put on tablet glabitalol, 100 milligram twice daily. Next slide. There was no history of gestational diabetes. Uh, level 2 ultrasonography was done, which was normal at uh, 18 weeks. Uh, mother was diagnosed hypothyroid, for which she was taking thyronom tablet, 25 microgram per day. Uh, there was a history of IUD in the first pregnancy. The cause could not be ascertained. Uh, the history could not be elicited. The second baby had imperfonate anus, which was corrected surgically. Uh, delivery was conducted again at a government hospital uh, by elective LSCS. Next slide. Uh, in the labor and delivery details, there was no feature of chorionitis. There was no history of any leaking, no history of any bleeding. She underwent uh, 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 elective LSCS in view of previous LSCS and gestational hypertension at a private nursing home. There was meconium present and uh, baby, baby needed resuscitation, but full details of resuscitation could not be obtained. Abgar score, which was mentioned in the discharge slip, was 6 by 10 at 1 minutes and 8 by 10 at 5 minutes. Delayed cord clamping again was not mentioned in the referral slip. Baby was shifted to this hospital in view of worsening respiratory distress. At admission, temperature was 36.2. Respiratory rate was 70. Heart rate was 142 per minute. Baby was pink. The cord was meconium stained. Chest retractions were there. Bilateral air entry was there and equal. There were no added sounds. Next slide. The downy score was 3 by 10. So baby was started on nasal CPAP at 5 cm of water and FiO2 of 30%. Saturation was 92% with no preductal and postductal variation. IV fluids were started and antibiotics started after taking samples, including the blood culture. Next slide. CPAP requirement increased to 6 cm and FiO2 increased the requirement increased to 60% in view of worsening respiratory distress. Downy score increased to 5 by 10. Chest X-ray showed slight worsening over three hours. Baby was given surfactant at six hours of age. Dobutamine was started in view of shock, which resolved over the next 24 hours, and dobutamine was tapered and stopped. Next slide. These were the investigations with the hemoglobin of 14.5. TLC was 5,700, platelets 50,000. Sugar was 87 milligram per deciliter, and ABG showed 7.32 pH. Partial pressure of oxygen was 45, PSEO2 was 64, and bicarbonate was 20. Baby was extubated uh, after three hours, uh, after six hours of uh, 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 intubation and put on an IV mode of ventilation. The uh, ABG has improved. The uh, the pH was seven point three four. The partial pressure of oxygen was sixty five. PSU two improved uh, was forty eight. Bicarbonate was twenty four. Uh, at the time when I uh, prepared, the blood culture was awaited. Uh, creatinine was normal. Sodium, potassium, and calcium was normal. A repeat platelets after 24 hours was 1.2 lakhs. Functional echo was done, which was normal. Babies presently uh, was on an IV mode and tolerating 25 ml of tube feeding to hourly. So uh, I would like to summarize. It was a 38 weeks, two days old female baby, appropriate for gestational age, delivered by LSCS to 34 years old gravida 3 female with gestational hypertension, resuscitated at birth, dwelt mass with shock, received ventilator support, and surfactant and is presently on NIV mode and tube feeding and improving well. Diagnosis was 38 weeks, 2 days, appropriate for gestational age, meconium aspiration syndrome with shock.
Thank you, Dr. Virinder. I mean, it was a very clear presentation and uh, you uh, stuck to the time, which allows us enough time for discussion. Yeah. Obviously, uh, uh, we had shared the uh, the text on meconium aspiration management, so we didn't want to duplicate it here. All of you might have read it and also watched the video. So in terms of uh, discussion, I would like the audience, I mean, the students to ask questions first, and then I will take some questions. Uh, please ask Dr. Virender. Any... Yeah. I think, uh, Harsh, uh, you need to mute. Yeah. Uh, Abhishek? Uh... Uh, so I stop sharing, thing? doctor? No, it's okay. Yes. We may have to go back to some slides. Okay, so keep all it right. there. Okay. Uh, doctor Virendra, one thing I want to ask, like antenatal steroids, you have not mentioned anywhere. Uh, I think that is an important thing. So uh, there was no uh, antenatal steroids given. It was a, a planned LSCS at 38 weeks, sir. So no antenatal steroids were given to this paper. Okay. So Dr. Mala has a question. Uh, why the shock was diagnosed in this case or how it was diagnosed? Sir, uh, the, there was, uh, the CRT was prolonged and the uh, peripheral pulses were weak. Sir, we do not have uh, invasive uh, BP monitoring in, with, uh, in our setup and uh, there were cold peripheries. And uh, sir, I, actually I am on leave. So I just uh, went for one day and this was the picture I could collect from the file. So uh, because I am a fellow and I have to appear for the exam, sir, in 24th February. So I'm being on. No, no, it's uh, okay. I mean, uh, basically you feel the baby was underperfused and uh, why do you was started? But let's not go into the hemodynamic management because Dr. Pradeep will have a session later on. In terms yes. of uh, shock, obviously... Uh, Personal preferences manage, and we will not go into again. Dr. Pyle has asked why not uh, different inotropes. So, that the topics of discussion today is more of good respiratory distress. So, let's stick to that. But in terms of shock diagnosis in a baby with respiratory distress, different thresholds uh, may be there. And obviously, you need to. This is a baby who transferred from outside. So, the hypoperfusion can be because of hypothermia as well. So, Priority should be to correct uh, hypothermia is one of the factors which affects affectant uh, efficiency yeah. as well. But even there is uh, there is no uh, not uh, there is a uh, small mentioning about the asphyxia part also. Baby was resuscitated also, and even birth asphyxia can also sometimes lead to cardiovascular uh, you know compromise, and yes. baby can and have. Obviously, shock. I mean whether you start inotropes or you correct the other factors and observe the uh, progress of this baby is important. So, uh, any other questions? Good evening, sir. Yes, Dr. Saravana. Uh, could it be the TTNB, sir? There is no chest X-ray. Chest X-ray was not taken. And uh, clinically, where we had distress, the initial score was uh, 3 by 10 down score. Sir, uh, I had uh, the X-rays I had taken. Actually, I tried to upload with the X-rays and uh, the picture of the baby also and video also. I couldn't upload because the it was showing high uh, MBs and I could not. I, I was not technically so strong and I had to delete it and only then I could uh, send the video. that Metrain have a full technical team. You are on a technical group. So you can uh, share your presentation with them and share the X-ray and video and they will be able to add it. Sure, In sir. terms of sure, down sir. score, that's the next presentation. But obviously... Your clinical assessment, I mean, this is a baby with meconium aspiration. There is a risk of PPHN and the baby was on oxygen requirement. Can I ask you, what is the target oxygen saturation in your unit? Sir, uh, we target for 90 to 95. But sir, in meconium aspiration, because since there are chances of sir PPHN, the target should be slightly on the higher side, sir. So when you say the baby needed 60%, uh, is it accurate that uh, the oxygen requirement was high? So the oxygen requirement was high, sir. Because your decision for surfactant is based on presumably the high oxygen requirement. Uh, and so the X-ray was also that... showing. Yeah. Yeah. So the X-ray, the, the second X-ray, which was done after four hours, sir, it showed white out. Uh, so there was more, uh, you know, the haziness was increasing and there was what no you volume. can do, Dr. Abhirinder, I mean, we all know this case now. Uh, hide sir. the patient details and share the X-ray on the group. Okay. Sir. So just uh, share it on the group, uh, take a picture on your camera so people can look through. Dr. Momita, the question about surfactant is the same one I raised now. So obviously, uh, if you base it only on the oxygen requirement, you need to be clear that it also depends on the saturation targets. I mean, if you're targeting 98 or 99, which is not necessary to target, your FAO2 will be high proportionately. But if you're targeting 95, close to 95 is acceptable in this situation because you don't want to go on the lower side and have a risk of hypoxia. So that's fine. Uh, Jyoti, I think you can stop screen share now. 
Any other questions for Dr. Virendra or about the corneum aspiration? You can, uh, yeah, that's fine. Anyone has any questions uh, about the presentation? Anyone wants to comment on the presentation style or the slides or anything like that? I mean, please don't take it personally if anyone has any comments. Uh, it's purely for our own uh, improvement and we are all in the process. So don't be uh, upset if anyone comments on your slides or anything like that. No, just yes, have to go, Pinathan. Please unmute yourself. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone. It was a nice presentation, sir. Uh, so the, my doubt is uh, when there is a tracing requirement of this uh, O2, and we decided to go with the uh, uh, surfactant. Uh, do we necessarily intubate and uh, surfactant? and continue on mechanical ventilation or uh, we give uh, to uh, least invasive or then uh, switch over to wait and see if it improves and then go ahead with mechanical, mechanical ventilation. Which one will be better? I mean, this is a diagnosis what we usually do is we of the Yeah, I mean, I'll just answer this. I mean, in terms of meconium aspiration, because there is a high risk of uh, PPHN and also there is a late chemical pneumonitis, we cannot predict the baby's response. It's not like typical RDS where you know baby is going to behave this way. So better to intubate and keep ventilated for a few hours or a day or so and then extubate because you don't know how the baby is going to behave. The pathogenesis, the lung involvement is not homogeneous and it's not predictable because you may have ball valve mechanism, you may have over distension, but you have to wean the pressures quickly after the surfactant because there's a high chance of air leak as well with meconium aspiration. Dr. Yes. Mishan. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, sir, uh, we had a similar uh, case uh, just a few days back. Uh, this, uh, the case discussed, the baby improved uh, quite uh, in a good time. So, our baby had a significant tachypnea and uh, the respiratory support requirement for like around uh, 10 days to 2 weeks. So, I just wanted to ask, is there any role of uh, inhaled or oral steroids uh, if the uh, this tachypnea and the respiratory distress is persisting? Yes, I mean, I have a video on this. I'll share it in the group. Okay. Okay, sure. Okay, sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dr. Gaurav? Uh, so I just wanted to know, uh, is there a timeline where we can use the surfactant? Um, so yeah, uh, see, there is, uh, ideally, if the FIO2 requirement is more than 50%, and uh, ideally, it should be given early before six hours. Uh, that's the uh, thing which I read. I mean, in it's this case, I mean, you don't need to go for the early surfactant uh, guidance. Uh, obviously, if the baby is stable and not meeting the criteria otherwise, but you don't want the baby to go downhill as well because of the PPHN physiology can flip quickly. So if you're convinced that the baby has an RDS pathogenesis, in this case, you didn't do an echo to see whether PPHN was contributing to your high FAO2. So that's one additional thing we might consider. The echo was done. I mentioned it. You and was done. it was normal. Okay, good. So that's important as well as we discussed in the beginning. So that's uh, another factor as well. So when you intervene, obviously, uh, in any severe disease, the earlier you intervene, the better. But uh, the six-hour criteria or the early surfactant better is more for RDS. In meconium aspiration, you wait for your respiratory support to work. I mean, sometimes you have not given enough CPAP pressure, for example. I mean, there was a time... When I was training, we were hesitant to give CPAP or non-invasive support for meconium aspiration. But nowadays, the concept has changed. So we are more comfortable. And there was a question from one of you whether high flow is better. Uh, obviously, we do have RAM cannula and other nasal cannula interfaces. And we have a higher pressure requirement. Uh, so high flow may not be the preferred first choice in evolving lung disease in a big baby. So I would personally say CPAP. But you can use a RAM cannula-like interface uh, to make the... Uh, baby more comfortable because it's a term baby who may be fighting the CPAP prongs and things like that. So use a comfortable interface. If you are using RAM cannula in your unit, remember that you may need a higher pressure because there is resistance in the circuit. You need about 30% more than what you would be giving otherwise. So if you say a CPAP of six, it may baby may be getting a CPAP of four. So you may need to give a CPAP of seven or eight in these babies even. And uh, uh, once you have given adequate pressure uh, and then you reassess the baby's oxygen requirement, make sure there is no PPHN, make sure the oxygen requirement is real. And then you can decide on uh, the usage of surfactant. So no need to rush to give surfactant. And remember, the risk of air leak is more if you give yes. surfactant uh, and it causes over distension in a certain part, you may end up with complications. And you can give these babies time because these are not babies who are going to tire out quickly. 
So unless there is a rapid worsening, you don't need to rush to give. Some of these babies may just improve with time. And surfactant is expensive as well. I don't know how the payment mechanism works with insurance in India now. But uh, in terms of uh, cost effectiveness also, you don't need to rush. That's my view. And you have up to 24 hours to decide on a surfactant. Unless there is rapid worsening, you don't need to rush. If baby is stable, you can give it some time and make sure you're giving enough pressure. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Lethil. Uh, I think you had raised your okay, hand. And... My, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I raised my hand earlier. I think you partly answered my question, but I was I wanted to ask, are we no. saying in RODS if we've got PPH in it's a it's a it's a contra contraindication for giving surfactant or we should wait? No, I mean obviously if you have the RDS physiology, the one of the doctors commented earlier that you need to treat the lung disease appropriately. So I have mm -hmm. a write-up on TPHN as well, which I will share later uh, because we are not going to that stage. As we discussed in the introduction, we don't want to go too fast. Just go step by step in the course so that, I mean, I know all of you know all these conditions and you are raring to go. That's why the question uh, from uh, our colleague on extubation today also, I didn't want to discuss in the group because we have a separate uh, chapter on extubation itself. So we will have, that's why we said okay. we can discuss it closer to the time. Akansha? Okay. Yes, sir. Sir, my question is when the baby deteriorated and down is a score increased to 5, then uh, we increase FiO2 to 60%. Uh, what about uh, PEEP? Uh, should we uh, target PEEP also? Should we have, should we have like increased PEEP also to 6 or yes. 7 and wait it? I think uh, I yeah, man, PEEP was increased to 6. Yes. Yeah. PEEP was increased to 6 centimeters. Yeah. So you need to increase the yes, pressure sir. and optimize it as well. Okay. Yes. So Dr. Virender, you presented very well and you answered the questions you, very well as well. Uh, share the x-rays in the group uh, if possible. I have shared. I have shared, sir. Already. Okay, good. <laughs>